In the study of functions of a single variable, we learn that the derivative of a function at a point is the slope of the graph of that function. So recall intuitively that if you have a function, then if a function is differentiable at a single point, then the derivative of f at c is interpreted as the slope of the function at that point when it's well defined. Now, there's another perspective on differentiable functions that's useful. The rigorous definition of the derivative is in terms of the limit as x approaches c of the function evaluated at x and its difference is taken away from c. Equivalently, f is differentiable at c if and only if there exists a number, a real number, which we denote by, let's say, just um, to be consistent with this notation, f prime c. Now we're interpreting this as just a, an ordinary number, such that the limit as h approaches 0 of the expression f of c plus h minus f of c minus f prime c times h divided by h equals 0. Now this expression looks a little bit more complicated than the original one, but all we've done was, in a sense, and you can prove, rig prove this rigorously, that we can move this to one side and that these two definitions are exactly equivalent. Now, let's think intuitively about what exactly the derivative is telling us. Let me redraw this function. And let's look at, again, the point C. If we take this definition, then what we're looking at is we're looking at the value of the function at an infinitesimally close neighboring point, which we'll call C plus H. Now, of course, this could be in either direction. It doesn't matter which direction H is coming from. H could be positive or negative. And this quantity here is the slope of the function times H. So, so if we visualize this as an arrow, a little infinitesimal length vector at the point C, the derivative is actually telling us, if this is length h, let's say, then what we're doing is we're multiplying the slope by that value. So we're moving along this line along that slope by the amount h with that appropriate factor for the slope. And this moves us very close to what the value of the function is at that point. So in some approximation, f of c plus h is approximately equal to f of c plus the derivative of f at c multiplied by h plus, of course, higher order terms. Now, this is just intuitively how the derivative works. Of course, we know that there are examples of functions that can't be approximated in this way. For instance, e to the minus 1 over x squared has some issues, especially at the origin, namely. Nevertheless, intuitively, let's think of the derivative as approximating the function at an infinitesimally close neighborhood of the point in a linear fashion. And let's extract this idea to multivariable case now. So now consider a function that's defined on some domain in Rn. So let's look at some domain in Rn. And first, for simplicity, let's assume that we have a function from Rn to R. 
And let's pick a point C in the domain of the function. And let's just restrict this function along a straight line through C in the direction E1. Now remember, E1 is just the unit vector, for instance, along the x-axis if we were talking about um, a region in the plane. And when we make this restriction, let's look at now what the value of the function is, again intuitively, at C plus H times E1. Now let's make sure that we all make that this all makes sense. C is the value of is C is the in the domain of the function, and as long as H is small enough, and our domain is an open domain, which we will assume throughout, then we can multiply the unit vector by H, and this quantity, this expression, is still in our domain as long as H is small enough. So this so it makes sense to talk about the value of f at this point. And if we wanted to approximate this function, then when we look at this expression, the only term in the domain of this function, in the input, that, that's varying is the first coordinate. Every other coordinate is completely fixed. And as a result, we can imagine that the value of this function is f of c plus now, since all the other terms are constant, we can pretend that it's not really a function of those variables. It's just a function of the first variable. So you can imagine taking the derivative of f, and I'll write this sort of uh, in a bad notation, and we'll change it just in a second, f prime at c times h times the vector e1 plus higher order terms. But this derivative is just the derivative for the first coordinates. So to be a little bit more precise with the notation, it might be better to write this as, let's say, um, d1f, where, that, where this just means taking the derivative of the function restricted to the first coordinate. Similarly, I can also consider the unit vector in the other direction, e2. And I can also look at the value of the function f at c plus h e2. And I can approximate this as well, assuming again you know, this vague intuitive notion of how we interpret the derivative as f of c plus. And this time we're taking the derivative along the y-axis, and all of the x values are remaining constant. And that defines another function, d2f at c times h e2 plus higher order terms. And now here comes the really key important vision. And this observation is that now let's consider an arbitrary linear combination of these two elements. And to actually make this a little bit um, more consistent. Let me call this letter K instead of H. Uh, that should be good. And now let's consider an arbitrary linear combination. And the linear combination is just the sum of these two. So we'll look at H E1 plus K E2, something like this. So this is the vector H E1 plus K E2. And again, as long as h and k are small enough, this is still in the domain of the function. f of c plus h e1 plus k e2. And when we're doing a first order approximation of a function, we're looking at the linear term. And because we're looking at the linear term, we know that when we combine these two effects, they'll be combined in a linear fashion. And as a result, we expect that this expression can be approximated by the value of the function at c plus the linear effects from each of the directions. So this will look like d1fc times h e1 plus d2f at c times h e2 plus d2f at 
times ke2 plus these higher order terms, which we're neglecting. What does this expression look like? We can imagine that this is a linear transformation that acts on R2 and gives us an element in R1. So we have that D1F at C and D2F at C can be viewed as a linear transformation from R2 to R. So a matrix, a 1 by 2 matrix, that acts on the vector H, K. And it gives me exactly this quantity over here. And this is the basic idea behind the derivative of a function with several variables. If you had three variables, then you would keep going, and you would have a 1 by 3 matrix acting on a three-component vector. And these vectors we should think of as being infinitesimally close to C. However, of course, once we know that we have a linear transformation available, then that linear transformation is well defined for all vectors, and we can extend as well. Now, the difference, the important thing to note is that although the, ve the function might not be well defined at that point plus that vector, that large vector, because we could leave our domain, this differential, this derivative, this matrix, should be well defined for those quantities um, since we want to extrapolate as far as we can uh, our function, whether or not it's a good approximation.